بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد um, I apologize I'm suffering from severe allergies as you know this time of the year it happens but inshallah I will try my best to continue from where we left off <clears throat> so last week we had discussed what have we discussed who can remind me um, can you close the door can you close the door there's noise coming from the outside what was our discussion last week the definition of Ahlul Bayt. And what is the correct position? What is the definition of Ahlul Bayt? The whole Quraysh? So who? That's the, the question. Banu Hashim is the opinion of one madhab. Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib added together is the pin of another method. And we said, in reality, um, the only lineage that people still are aware of is that of the Banu Hashim. Uh, the rest of them have been pretty much forgotten. So definitely of the Al al-Bayt is our person that we're going to discuss, that is Abdullah bin Abbas. And before we discuss Abdullah bin Abbas, we need to discuss the family of Abdullah bin Abbas. So we begin with none other than Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And today we will discuss uh, briefly Abbas and the other children of Abbas uh, so that we get an idea of the household of our person, Abdullah ibn Abbas. We'll also discuss the mother of Abdullah ibn Abbas. So today's lecture will be the family of Abdullah ibn Abbas, and that is Abbas radiallahu an and his wife. And their children, some of them, we'll mention not all of them, as usual, many of the Sahaba, they had lots of children, and obviously we're not going to discuss all of them. So Al-Abbas, everybody knows who he is. He is one of the most famous uncles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And remind me again, how many of his uncles accepted Islam? Remind me. Two. Two. Who is the third? Two. Two uncles accepted Islam. And uh, the other one was, of course... The other one was, of course, accepted Islam. No, Abbas, the other one, other than Abbas. Hamza radiallahu an. okay. And Hamza radiallahu an, he died when? Uhud. He died in the battle of Uhud. So therefore, for the longest time, the only uncle of the Prophet wasallam that was a Muslim was Al-Abbas. Okay, the only uncle that was alive after uh, the battle of Badr and the only uncle that was a Muslim, therefore, was Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas, radiallahu an, he was older than the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by around two or three years. It is reported in the Sunan al-Tirmidhi, somebody asked Abbas, radiallahu an, أَأَنْتَ أَكْبَرُ أَمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم? Are you Akbar? Are you bigger, older? Or the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So Al-Abbas said, Ana asannu minhu wa huwa akbaru minni. Okay, I am older than him, but he is bigger than me. Okay, because the phrase akbar can also mean greater than. So the phrase, Anta akbaru am Rasulullah al Abbas said, I am older than him, but he is akbar than me. Meaning he has a higher qadr in the eyes of Allah than I do. And Al Abbas radiallahu an. He, as you know, each of the Quraysh in the days of Jahiliyyah, each of the main tribes, they had a major uh, responsibility when it comes to uh, the uh, Kaaba and when it comes to the pilgrimage. And Al-Abbas radiallahu an had one of the most honorable responsibilities pre-Islam. And that is the responsibility of what is called the Siqaya. What is the Siqaya? The Siqaya is to bring the water for the pilgrims. And it was considered to be of the greatest honor uh, to help the Hujjaj and to allow them to drink during the days of Hajj. And in fact, it remained in the progeny of Al-Abbas and the children of Al-Abbas for another hundred years. So after Al-Abbas passed away, his children, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, they continued this great honor of providing the water to the pilgrims, the Hujjaj, until finally when the Abbasids came to power, we'll come to them inshallah later on, when the Abbasids came to power, then when they were the Khulafa, they said, they felt, oh, this is now, we have to now move on from this one. So they handed it over to another uh, sub-tribe. And it is mentioned that he boasted of this privilege when he was captured at Badr. Uh, when he was captured at Badr. If you remember, Al-Abbas was captured as a prisoner of war in the Battle of Badr. And... Uh, Al-Abbas said to his captors, 
if you think you're better than us because of your Islam, well then I am better than you because I fed the water to the pilgrims and I used to take care of Masjid al-Haram. Okay, so he said this to his captors. That if you, your Islam is better than mine or your Islam is earlier than mine, then I am better than you in that I have given water to the pilgrims and I have taken care of the hujjaj. So Allah revealed in the Quran a verse in Surah At-Tawbah, which is, أَجَعَلْتُمْ سِقَايَةَ الْحَاجِّ وَعِمَارَةَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ كَمَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَجَاهَدَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لَا يَسْتَوُونَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Do you make the giving of water and the taking care of the haram as the same as the one who believes in Allah and who performs the hijrah and who does jihad, those two are not equal. Those two are not equal. You gave water, they believed. And they emigrated. And they performed jihad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then um, gently, gently chastised Al-Abbas for his statement and said that is not better. لا يستوون عند الله And Al-Abbas radiallahu an, before we get to Badr, um, he was a sympathetic non-Muslim in the Meccan era. Okay? He was a sympathetic non-Muslim similar to Abu Talib. Similar to Abu Talib. He did not embrace Islam in the Meccan era. And he never did anything to hurt any Muslim. In fact, he did some things here and there that demonstrate his loyalty to the Prophet as an uncle, not as a Muslim, as an uncle. And most importantly, on the, in the covenant of Aqaba, which took place with the Ansar, with the people of Medina, when the people of Medina came to Mecca and they said to the Prophet we're willing to take you. We're willing to bring you back with us. It was Al-Abbas who negotiated the details of the treaty. It was Al-Abbas who went with the Prophet on the night of Aqaba, the second Bay'atul Aqaba, right before the Hijrah. And it was Al-Abbas who said that I speak on behalf of the Quraysh, this is our nephew, we are handing him over to your protection with the condition that you protect him like you protect your own children, your own families, etc, etc. That was Al-Abbas. So Al-Abbas was representing the Quraysh, or at least those who were sympathetic to the Prophet because obviously you had the uh, Abu, uh, Abu Lahabs and they were not sympathetic. So Abbas represented the sympathetic bastion of the Quraysh. And in the battle of Badr, he was taken a prisoner. So he fought on the other side. However, the Prophet ﷺ had explicitly mentioned Abbas by name before the battle of Badr. And one or two other people. And he said, when you see them, capture them and do not kill them. Why? Who remembers from the battle of Badr five years ago we did it? Who remembers? Because they have been forced on the battlefield. They did not come willingly. So the Prophet ﷺ said, when you see Abbas, do not harm him. Do not kill him. Do not strike him. Capture him and bring him. So Abbas was one of the two or three people mentioned by name, prohibited to be killed on the battle of Badr. And that is uh, why when the Ansari uh, came who had captured Abbas, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, here is Al-Abbas, I captured him. He was boastful that I have captured Abbas. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Mah, no, you have not captured him. Rather, it was an angel who uh, helped you to capture Abbas. And Abbas verified that, yes, Ya Rasulullah, there was a person, you know, on a, uh, you know, a, cam on a, on a horse and whatnot, and he uh, captured me. And then this man took me after that. So an angel... Uh, basically made sure that Abbas was protected by capturing him and then handed him over to one of the Muslims and that Ansari brought him back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when the time came to ransom, when the time came to suggest a ransom, uh, Al-Abbas said uh, that, Ya Rasulullah, I'm a Muslim. He said, I'm a Muslim. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, what is in your heart, Allah knows. We have to judge by the outer. So even his uncle, he did not take anything other than the outward. He did not believe his uncle outwardly. He said, if, if you are a Muslim, that's between you and Allah. 
we have to judge on the outer. And what is the outer? You were on the other side. And you were fighting us. So I'm going to set your ransom. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have any money. I don't have any money. So the Prophet ﷺ said, And how about the money that one day before you went on a journey, you hid it in such and such a place, and then you went to your wife, Umm al-Fadl, and you said to her, if something happens to me, then give this much to Abdullah, and give this much to Ubaidullah, and give this much to Qutham, and give this much to Fadl. And he mentioned each one by quantity and what not. Immediately Abbas said, I testify that you are the messenger of Allah, because nobody knows of that other than me and Umm al-Fadl. The fact that you know that I have money hidden in this place, and the quantity, and you know how much I said, only Allah could have told you this. So, subhanAllah, he says he was the Muslim and we believe him. But when he heard the Prophet ﷺ testify to that, his iman itself went up. And he clearly then embraced Islam. Now, there is an opinion, and this is now where the slight controversy occurs, that no, he did not embrace Islam until right before the conquest of Mecca. And the reason why some people have this opinion is because the Prophet ﷺ, uh, essentially allowed Abbas to go back to Mecca. Now, why would he go back to Mecca when everybody had to migrate to Medina in this interim time frame? And this is where the second opinion comes, which is Ibn Hajar and the majority opinion, that Al-Abbas was sent in order to inform about the ongoings of the people of Mecca. Okay, so he was sent essentially to collect information and to send it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to inform the Prophet Sallallahu of what is happening in Mecca. So he was essentially a covert Muslim, a secret Muslim if you like, and the people of Mecca did not know about this and Al-Abbas would then send, and that is why also we say that this is the way that the Prophet Sallallahu found out that uh, the Quraysh uh, are essentially leaving, uh, that the conquest of Mecca is going to take place. All of this, it was Al-Abbas who is giving him information based upon which the Prophet decided to go and do Fatih Mecca or the conquest of uh, Mecca. So Al-Abbas, the strongest position is that he embraced Islam after the Battle of Badr. And he was the only Muslim that was commanded to live in Mecca when every other Muslim was commanded to migrate away from Mecca. Okay, so Abbas has the distinct blessing of being the only Muslim who was given divine permission. Now, were there other Muslims in Mecca at the time? Yes or no? Yes. yes. And what was their status? Yeah. Not, openly Not openly Muslim. They were persecuted. Some of them were unable to even migrate. And they are forgiven because they were persecuted. Al-Abbas was not persecuted because they didn't think him to be a Muslim. And Al-Abbas was of the highest nobility of the Quraysh. So he was very strategically placed, lineage-wise and geography-wise. He was very strategically placed by the Prophet ﷺ in the heart of uh, Mecca. And uh, right before the conquest of Mecca, by a few days, Al-Abbas decided to leave Mecca and migrate to Medina. But it was too late to do the migration because the Prophet was already on his way to Mecca to conquer Mecca. So Al-Abbas met the army of the Prophet a day or two outside of Mecca. So Al-Abbas is leaving and the Prophet is arriving. So Al-Abbas is the only Sahabi who intended the Hijrah. So he got the Ajr of Hijrah but he never actually made the Hijrah. He never actually got there because the Hijrah is now finished because conquest of Mecca is taking place. So Al-Abbas did not make it to Medina at this point in time and that is because the Prophet already was on his way. Uh, so after the conquest of Mecca, uh, obviously his Islam is now public and Al-Abbas participates in the remaining battles. Therefore, Abbas did not participate in the early battles. How could he? He's in Mecca. 
The major battle he did participate in is the post-conquest of Mecca, which is the battle of Hunayn. And it is in the battle of Hunayn that Abbas's stature is demonstrated. If you remember in the battle of Hunayn, there was a trap set up and the Prophet entered the valley and from on top there were archers and the people had set up a trap and uh, many of the Muslims began to flee helter-skelter. Only a small group of Muslims remained around the Prophet Sallallahu At the head of them was Al-Abbas radiallahu an. Al-Abbas was the main person who remained when everybody was fleeing. And in fact, he was the one holding on to the stirrup of the horse of the Prophet He was holding on to it because even the horse is terrified. Even, even the horse wants to flee. And Al-Abbas was holding on to the stirrup of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Abbas, Oh Abbas, call out to the people. And he mentioned every tribe by name. And Abbas was known for many things of them. He had the loudest voice, the deepest voice. He had what is called the booming voice. You know, some people, when they speak the whole hall, Verber, verber, this is Abbas. When he spoke, it was a loud voice. So the Prophet said, Oh Abbas, call out to the Bani Fulan, the Bani Fulan, the Bani Fulan. And so Abbas began to call out. And the first group he called out was Bay'at al Ridwan. Oh people of Bay'at al Ridwan, where are you? And when Abbas said this, the whole valley shook with his voice. And by the hundreds and thousands, the Sahaba began to flock back. And then, Oh so and so, where are you? Oh so and so. And when they heard their name, they were jolted like with electricity and they came back to defend the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the main um, story of Abbas after the conquest of Mecca. Uh, obviously the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passes away a year or two after that and we don't have much uh, knowledge about him after that time. It appears he lived a very quiet, very apolitical life. He did not get involved in uh, the uh, controversies that uh, uh, or the issues that took place and he was not also given any major political position. He wanted to live a quiet life after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At some point towards the end of his life, he became blind. He became blind and so he spent the last few years of his life uh, not able to uh, see. Um, one of the main uh, incidents narrated about him is that in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, when there was that infamous drought, that infamous drought that caused the deaths of lots of people and animals and livestock and, and, uh, and, and agriculture. So there was uh, the call for Salat al-Istisqa, the rain prayer. And Al-Abbas was already blind at that time. So Umar ibn al-Khattab commanded everybody should leave Medina and pray the rain prayer. And the way that they would do this, they would go to a place outside of Medina, these days is called Masjid al-Ghamama. If you exit from the Masjid of the Prophet on the front side and you walk towards the right hand side, you will see a Masjid uh, outside of the marble place. And that is called Masjid al-Ghamama. That is where they would go to pray the Salat al-Istisqa. In those days that was considered outside the city. These days you're still considered to be inside the Haram. You know, you literally just exit the gates that are there. And then that's Masjid Al-Khamama over there. So Umar ibn Khattab gave the khutbah, the Salat Al-Istisqa. And then he said, Oh Allah, and this is a famous hadith that has a lot of theological uh, discussion. Allahumma inna kunna natawassalu ilayka bi nabiyyika. والآن نتوسل إليك بعم نبيك قم يا عباس وادعو الله أن يسقينا O Allah we used to make tawassul through your prophet and now we will make tawassul through the uncle of your prophet stand up O Abbas and make dua to Allah that it rains so Abbas stood up and he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a sincere prayer that it rained. And it is said that it rained after that point in time. Now, Al-Abbas, uh, so what is the theological controversy? Uh, the phrase, we used to do tawassul through your prophet. What does this mean? We used to do tawassul through your prophet. And there are various interpretations. What does this mean? But the hadith is very obvious what it means. The fact that Umar is speaking in the past. We used to do tawassul. Then he's saying we can no longer do it. So now we're going to do it through Abbas. And then he says, stand up, O Abbas, and make dua. So what is tawassul here? Tawassul is to make dua. So it is permissible to ask a living person to make dua for something that you need. 
This is the tawassul that is permitted. Okay, the tawassul that is the gray area, the tawassul that is the point of controversy, and that's where this hadith is used by both sides to prove and against, is the tawassul by the name of a dead person. So you say, O oh Allah, by the rank of your Prophet, bi maqami nabiyyika, bi jahi nabiyyika, right? Uh, I ask you by the status of your Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay? Ya Allah, apke nabi ke vaste se. Okay, this type of phrasing is the gray area. And some groups allow it, and some groups don't allow it. And the groups that allow it have their evidences, the groups that don't allow it have their evidences, and both of them use this hadith. Inna kunna and whatever position you follow, in my opinion, this hadith cannot be used. This hadith is very explicit. Because this hadith, this hadith clearly shows what type of tawassul is this hadith talking about. It's not by the name of a dead person. It is by the dua of a living person. Is that clear? Right? So this hadith cannot be used uh, by the camp that wants to prove it. And they have their other evidences which is not the place to get into right now. So Al-Abbas lived a few more years after this. He passed away uh, in the year 32 AH. 32 AH. And so he did not live to see the civil war between the Sahaba. He passed away before the time of the civil war. And he passed away at the ripe old age of 85. عن, at the ripe old age of 85. Uh, Al-Zahabi mentions that Abbas عن, was of a handsome appearance. Tall with a deep and booming voice. And he would typically braid his hair in two braids, two knots. So in the Arabs in those days, the men would braid hair in a masculine knot, you know. In these days, even there are some men that have their, their thing. There's a masculine way to do it, there's a feminine way to do it. And the pre-Islamic Arabs, they would have that. So Abbas uh, had those two knots as well. And Abbas, radiallahu an, he had ten children. Ten children and either three or four wives, either three or four wives. We're not going to go over all of the children. We'll just mention his first wife and his most famous wife and uh, four or five of his most famous uh, uh, children. And of course, Abdullah bin Abbas is the most famous child. I will mention him in detail, inshallah, in our next class. Today we'll talk about his family. And then next week we'll talk about Abdullah ibn Abbas. So Al-Abbas radiallahu an's first wife is his most famous wife and also one of the most famous sahabiyat. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a very special relationship with this aunt of his, because this is his aunt, right? It is his aunt. And so this uh, sahabiyya, uh, she is known primarily by her kunya, so much so that the majority of people don't even know her full name. Her kunya is Umm al-Fadl, Umm al-Fadl. And al-Abbas is called Abu al-Fadl, Abu al-Fadl. So Umm al-Fadl is her most common uh, nomenclature, but her actual name is Lubaba. Lubaba uh, bint al Hadith, and in fact, uh, she's also called Lubaba al Kubra, the bigger Lubaba, because she has a younger sister called Lubaba al Sughra, the smaller Lubaba. But she is commonly known, known as Umm al Fadl. And Umm al Fadl, she appears in the seerah a lot of times, but usually in the background, as is the case with most women in the seerah, you, they don't have prominent roles, but she is clearly there. And in a number of traditions, we learn that uh, the Prophet ﷺ would visit the house of Abbas and Umm al-Fadl regularly in the days of Mecca. And uh, in the days of Mecca, it was very common, especially after Khadija died, that he would spend the afternoons with Abbas and his aunt, Umm al-Fadl. And in fact, he would usually have his afternoon nap in the house of Umm al-Fadl. Uh, so he, and this is his aunt, he has a very close relationship with her. Um, and uh, it is also mentioned that the first lady to convert after Khadija was Umm al-Fadl. So this is one of those interesting tidbits to ask, who was the first woman to convert after Khadija? It is Umm al-Fadl, the wife of Abbas. Now, in those times, I shouldn't say in those times, in that time frame, a Muslim lady could be married to a non-Muslim man. So Umm al-Fadl had converted, and Abbas did not convert at this time, and that was fine at that time. Because only later on was it made haram. Okay? So, Umm al-Fadl had converted, and Abbas did not mind the conversion, which shows he was very sympathetic to Islam. But as we know, he only actually converted in the conquest of uh, Mecca. And um, 
Umm al Fadl uh, Lubaba, by the way, I mentioned her um, a few months ago in somewhat detail when we talked about Khalid ibn al Walid and the mother of Khalid ibn al Walid. And I'm sure all of you remember all of the genealogy, correct? So there's no need to go over it. And our note taker isn't even here for me to quiz him. Uh, not that he ever can answer, but that's okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, nobody can ever answer these questions, but that's okay. I'll very quickly go over it because I know, obviously, it's uh, too many names to remember. Uh, Umm al-Fadl, Umm al-Fadl, it is said by our early historians that this family of sisters was the most noble family in human history when it comes to the son-in-laws that their mother had. I, all of these sisters, their husbands, were the most noble in all of human history for one family to be a part of. Is that clear? Right? So the mother of Lubaba, her son-in-laws, by the way, the mother of Lubaba died in the days of pre-Islam. She never accepted, I mean, she never saw Islam. But that family, she, Lubaba's mother, had six daughters. And the husbands of these six, our scholars have said, no mother was more dignified with her son-in-laws than the mother of Lubaba. Okay, so, and I, and I mentioned this when we talked about Khalid, because obviously they're related, so we're going to very quickly mention, so that it was just a refresher, that there were six, six sisters. Okay, Lubaba is number three of the six. Lubaba is number three. And uh, Lubaba's mother married three times, one after the other. So there are three different fathers to these six sisters. Clear? Okay. The first of her husbands was Khuzayma. So Zainab binti Khuzayma was born. And that's the eldest sister of Lubaba. Who is Zainab binti Khuzayma? Our mother. One of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was married to the Prophet in the third year of the Hijrah, and she was one of the few who passed away in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu So, Zainab bint Khuzayma, the oldest sister, and her husband is the Prophet Sallallahu so she is our mother. Then, uh, Khuzayma died, so she, the mother married Al-Harith. And from Al-Harith, she had three daughters. Maymuna bint Al-Harith, also our mother. Now, it's not allowed to marry two sisters in the same time frame. Zainab bint Khuzayma died. Two, three years went by. Then the Prophet married Maymuna bint al Hadith in the seventh year of the Hijrah. And Maymuna and Zainab, by the way, this is not Zainab bint al Jah. Don't get confused. There were two Zainabs. Zainab bint al Jah is the cousin of the Prophet. That Surah Al Ahzab was revealed, right? That was, she was the wife of, the wife of, the wife of Zayd, right? And Allah revealed in the Quran verses that we talked about, that awkward story we talked about it. That's another Zainab. This is Zainab bint Khuzayma. Her younger sister is Maymuna bint al Hadith, and she was one of the wives of the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, she was one of the last to die as well in the year 51 Hijrah. 51, one of the last of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to die. Her younger sister from the same father, Lubaba bint al Hadith. This is the wife of Abbas. Okay, so the two older sisters are married to the Prophet ﷺ. Third sister uh, is the wife of Abbas, and she was the main wife of Abbas, and she remained his wife throughout her life. She never married any other uh, husband, and she died uh, married to Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, for some reason that I don't know why, the same parents had another daughter, and they gave her the same name. You know what happens. It's rare, but it happens. Okay, so... There was two, there were two Lubabas. Lubaba al-Kubra and Lubaba al-Sughra. Clear? Lubaba al-Kubra is the wife of Abbas. Lubaba al-Sughra was the wife of al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, the father of Khalid ibn al-Walid. Okay? So this is why I went into that story back then. A few months ago, and with Khalid and Walid, I mentioned the story of Khalid, the mother of Khalid. Then I went into a lot more detail. I'm just re reminding, you know, refreshing your memories. Yeah, right. But anyway, just refreshing your memories about what we had already discussed. So that is the second Lubaba. She is the mother of Khalid ibn al Walid. Then Al Hadith as well, the marriage ended, and the, this lady married the final of her husbands, and that is uh, Umais. 
and from Umais she had Asma binti Umais and Arwa binti Umais. And Asma binti Umais, we have mentioned her story at least 10 times in the seerah. And she has so many incidents and whatnot. But the main thing is she married Ja'far and then she married Abu Bakr and then she married Ali radiallahu anhu. And from each of them she had children. This is Asma binti Umais. So of the son-in-laws of this lady is Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And then the youngest daughter of hers, Arwa binti Umais, she was the wife of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, and from them they also had children. So just look at this group of son-in-laws that this one lady had, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hamza Abbas, and Abu Bakr, and Ali, and Ja'far, and Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, who was not a Muslim, but he was the most famous chieftain of the Banu Khuzayma, as you know. Uh, so, this is, these are the six sisters. We are interested in number three right now, and that is who? What's her name? Lubaba. Lubaba. And she is known as? Um al-Fadl. Um al-Fadl is the common name that historians know her by and the people of Sira know. Um al-Fadl. Um al-Fadl. And we said that uh, the Prophet ﷺ had a very close relationship with this aunt and uh, uh, she, he was a regular at the house of Abbas and uh, his aunt um, Um al-Fadl. Um, um al-Fadl, uh, she passed away two years before her husband in the year 30 Hijra, 30 after the Hijra, And uh, they had many children. Uh, all of the famous children of Abbas were through, were uh, from Umm al-Fadl. He had other children from other wives and they're not as famous. So uh, it is Umm al-Fadl and Abbas radiallahu an who have the series of famous children. We will only mention four of them and all of them are relatively famous. The, the second one is Abdullah ibn Abbas we'll mention in next week's class. So today we'll mention the remaining three. The eldest son of Abbas and Lubaba is whom? Fadl. Don't you get it? Abu al-Fadl, Umm al-Fadl. The eldest son of Abbas is Fadl. And al-Fadl ibn Abbas, uh, not much is known about him. Uh, one of his most famous incidents in the seerah. And again, al-Fadl was not in Medina, remember. Al-Fadl was not in Medina. He was in Mecca with his father. Uh, and what we know about Al-Fadl, the main incident in his whole life was that he was the one who accompanied the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the same animal during Hajj. And so he gave us a lot of hadith about Hajj. So when the Prophet is doing Hajj, he took Al-Fadl behind him. Because you know in those days, you didn't have the luxury of having your own animal. You had to share animals. And Al-Fadl was the person who the Prophet ﷺ chose to be behind him. And at this point in time, he would have been a young man, um, probably 17 or something, like at the prime of his youth now. And so we have so many ahadith about Hajj because of Fadl, because he said the Prophet ﷺ took me behind him when he went on the camel during uh, the Hajj. And Al-Fadl passed away a year or two after the uh, death of the Prophet ﷺ, fighting, uh, in, uh, he died a shaheed in Ajnadain, the battle of Ajnadain, remember the conquest of Syria. Uh, he died in Ajnadain and uh, he is buried over there. The second son of Al-Abbas is our person, Abdullah ibn Abbas. I will mention him next week. That's the second son. So Abdullah ibn Abbas is not the eldest. He is the second eldest son. The third eldest son is Ubaidillah ibn Abbas. Ubaidillah ibn Abbas. And Ubaidillah ibn Abbas was one year younger than Abdullah ibn Abbas. One year younger. And therefore, when the Prophet died, he was probably around 12 years old. 12 years old. So he's old enough to remember and to narrate hadith. And we have a handful of hadith from Ubaidullah ibn Abbas. Ubaidullah, when he grew up, he became a very successful businessman. Very wealthy businessman. And he was one of the most generous of all of the Banu Hashim. It is said that he would sacrifice every single day a camel to feed anybody who wanted food. That is an immense amount of wealth. Every single day he would sacrifice a camel and have just an open uh, buffet. You know, just, you know how rich people sometimes they just feed the poor. Just have an open. Whoever wants to come and eat. And it is said that um, Abdullah ibn Abbas, our guy, said to his younger brother, don't do this. Don't, don't spend so much money. Every day you are feeding uh, like one camel is a lot of money. Don't do that. So he wanted to obey his older brother, but he still wanted to feed the poor. 
So what did he do? His brother told him, don't sacrifice a camel. He began sacrificing two camels every day <laughs> to get out of that. That, okay, I'll obey my brother. He said, don't sacrifice a camel. I won't sacrifice a camel. I'll sacrifice two camels now. So from then on, he sacrificed two camels every single day uh, till he died. And um, our historians have said that whoever wants to see, uh, sorry, they said, the household of Abbas has been blessed with everything, beauty, knowledge, and generosity. Whoever wants to see beauty or handsomeness, let him go to Al-Fadl, the eldest. Whoever wants to see knowledge, let him go to Abdullah ibn Abbas, and that's what we're going to discuss next week. And whoever wants to see karam, generosity, let him go to Ubaidillah. So, handsomeness, jamal, ilm, and karam. It's all in the household of Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. And there's a, a story narrated about him in the ancient books of history. Ibn Kathir and others narrated a very beautiful story. That one day, uh, Ubaidullah was traveling on one of his business trips, journeys. And he had his servants and whatnot with him. And he's in the middle of the desert. And he sees the tent of a Bedouin in the middle of the desert. And he uh, introduces uh, himself, but not as... The Banu Hashim, he simply says, I am a traveler, traveling. May we spend the night in your tent. Because it's cold, it's what not, may we spend the night in your tent. So the, travel, the Bedouin did not recognize who is this man. But he said to his wife, we have a noble guest tonight. What do we have to feed him? And his wife said, you know, we have no food. She said, absolutely nothing. I mean, this is a noble guest. Let us give him honor. Let us honor him, even though he didn't recognize this is the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. So the wife said, we only have a goat left, and you know how much our daughter is attached to that goat. Don't kill the goat or our daughter is going to be heartbroken that, you know, you kill the goat. But he said, we must because this is an honorable guest, and we have to give our last goat to feed this guest of ours. So he did not realize that... Uh, Ubaidullah ibn Abbas was able to hear. He did not realize that. Their conversation was overheard by Ubaidullah ibn Abbas. So they sacrificed the goat and they fed Ubaidullah ibn Abbas. The next morning when they went to leave, Ubaidullah said to his servant, how much money do we have? He said, we have 500 dinars, 500 gold coins. So Ubaidullah said, give him the whole package. Leave nothing. The servant said, oh master, he gave you one goat that's worth two, three coins. And you're going to give him 500 coins? Just give him a few. He'll be more than happy. And Abba, uh, not Abbas, Ubaidullah said that, uh, woe to you. Don't you realize that he has been more generous than us? He has given everything of his. And I'm only giving him a fraction of mine. Like he was, mashallah, he was very rich. So he said, don't you realize he has outbeaten us? He gave everything of his. And I'm just giving a bit of mine. And so he gave him 500 gold coins, even though you could have purchased a goat for one maximum two gold coins. You could have purchased it. But he gave him all 500 and was left with no money till they got back to their destination. This was how um, basically Al Abbas, uh, uh, or Ubaidullah ibn Abbas was. And Ubaidullah lived a long life and he passed away uh, in the early time of the uh, Umayyad uh, Khilafah. So he lived to see Muawiyah and some even say Yazid. And he lived until the time of Yazid. Uh, the final son that we'll mention, there are more sons than this, but we're only interested in four of them. And all four are children of Umm al-Fadl. Okay, all four children of Umm al-Fadl. The final son, the youngest son that we'll mention is Qutham. Qutham. And Qutham, we have mentioned him before. Can anybody remember? When did we mention Qutham? We mentioned him before. Qutham was one of the four people who washed the body of the Prophet ﷺ. So he gets a very special honor. Very special honor. Actually, there were five people. There was a servant as well. But it was Abbas uh, and Fadl and Qutham and Ali radiallahu an. These were the four main people along with Shukran, the Mawla of the Prophet who washed uh, the body of the Prophet and Qutham 
uh, at this point in time, he was probably eight years old. They did not treat eight year olds old the way that we do. They have to be made into men. And even though he was eight, he was in the room and he helped turn the body of the Prophet. So obviously, he would not have done it by himself, he's too young to. But Fadl and Qutham and Abbas, عن, they were the three who were holding the body, and, and uh, Ali radiallahu an was the one uh, washing the body of the Prophet. And Shukran was. Uh, pouring water on the body of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And Qutham It is said that Qutham Out of all of the children of Al-Abbas He looked the most like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He looked the most like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam From the Banu Hashim There were four in particular Who were said to resemble the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Almost identically The most resembled of uh, Of all of the Sahaba were who? Who can tell me? That's number two. You're missing the most obvious. The most obvious. Young Sahabi. Hassan radiallahu anh. Hassan. Who is going to resemble the process more than his own grandson? Hassan was, it is said, an almost identical copy. No one was more close resembling to the Prophet than Hassan radiallahu anh. After Hassan, it was Ja'far. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And after Ja'far, it was Qutham ibn Abbas. After Qutham, it was another Sahabi. We mentioned him, a cousin. We mentioned him in the conquest of Mecca. Abu Sufyan, but not the Abu Sufyan of Badr. Abu Sufyan, the first cousin of the Prophet sallallahu Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib. So al-Harith is the eldest son of Abdul Muttalib and his son Abu Sufyan. And if you remember, the Prophet and Abu Sufyan were very close together growing up. But then Abu Sufyan became bitter enemy. And Abu Sufyan would write bad poetry. And when the conquest of Mecca took place, Abu Sufyan begged for mercy and he cried. And he brought his son and he said, I made a mistake, I acknowledge I made a mistake, and he accepted Islam. And the Prophet as well then forgave him. That is Abu Sufyan who is to resemble the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there were other brothers and sisters uh, of these four. As we said, there were ten uh, children of Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Uh, one of the interesting points as well, historians say that we have never seen a household whose graves are more scattered than the household of Al-Abbas and Umm Al-Fadl. All of these children were, were born in one house in Mecca, and each one was buried at a different corner of the Muslim empire. And this shows you how Islam was spread. This is the classic example of how Islam was spread. None of them were buried in Mecca. The oldest, Al-Fadl, we just mentioned where he died. Ajnadain. In the conquest of, essentially, Ajnadain opened the door for Jerusalem. The conquest of that region. Abdullah ibn Abbas, who knows where he is buried? Ta'if. I have visited the grave in Ta'if. It's a masjid, Masjid ibn Abbas. And right next to the masjid there is a grave. So ibn Abbas died in Ta'if. And that one, we'll get to his story. He wanted to flee from the internal warfares. Because he lived to see it. He did not want to participate. So he went to Ta'if, which was a quiet city. He was from Mecca, but when all of these fitan happened, he wanted to go underground. He did not want to be prominent. So he moved to the neighboring city of Ta'if, where he is buried to this day. So that is Ibn Abbas. The third, Ubaidullah, that we just mentioned, he died in the peripheries of Yemen. So from Syria, we get all the way to Yemen. Qutham died as a shaheed in the Ma'raka of Samarqand. Way over there, Samarqand, beyond Afghanistan. Abdul Rahman, another son, died also in Syria. And Ma'bad, another son, died in essentially what is now Libya or something. Right? So look at the geographical regions where each one of these sons is buried. And you get the peripheries of the Muslim empire. Along with the center Ibn Abbas, which is Ta'if basically next to Mecca. And this shows us how Islam was uh, spread. Now, Abbas radiallahu anh, uh, there, 
are a number of traditions by him and from him. There are many blessings narrated about him. And of them is that uh, once somebody irritated Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu. And he came to the Prophet and, and the Prophet could recognize that he was irritated. And he asked him what had happened. So the Abbas told him all that had happened. So uh, the Prophet then said, Al-Abbas minni wa ana minhu. I am from Abbas and Abbas is from me. In another version of the hadith, he said, Don't you know that the am of a person is the same as his ab? So we have two beautiful hadith, you should memorize them. Al khalatu bi manzilatil um, you know, uh, and al ammu sinwu al ab. Okay, the khala, who's the khala? Mother's sister. Is like the mother, that's what our Prophet said. Al khala bi manzilatil um. And in this hadith, he said, Al am, who is the am? The father's brother. The father's brother is sinwu, which is similar to, is the same level as the father. Okay, so here also we see one of the reasons why our Prophet would respect Abbas so much. It was the last remnants, the link between him and his father. So this is the sin, this is the, uh, my, the equivalent of my father. So whoever makes him angry has made me angry. So this is the maqam that our Prophet gave to Al-Abbas in another hadith. He said, whoever irritates Abbas has irritated me. Whoever irritates Abbas has irritated me. And Al-Abbas did not narrate that many a hadith. Uh, he was a quiet man when it came to narrating hadith. We have a few hadith of his. One hadith only in Bukhari, two or three in Muslim. And in Muslim and Muhammad we have only five or six hadith uh, of Abbas. Not that many a hadith of Abbas. Now, one of the interesting things about Abbas uh, is that, of course, the most famous dynasty of Islam is named after him. And that is the Abbasid, the Banu Abbas. And the Abbasid dynasty is the longest ruling dynasty of Islam. No dynasty ruled for longer than the Abbasids from 750 to 1258 CE. Memorize these dates. 750 to 1258 CE. And it was Abbas's great-great-grandson whose name was As-Safah, who founded the dynasty. And then As-Safah died and his brother Al-Mansur took over. And from Al-Mansur you get the whole lineage of the Abbasid dynasty. So all of them, Harun al-Rashid and Al-Amin and Al-Wathiq and Al-Ma'moon, all of them are direct descendants of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. So all the Khulafa are literally the lineage of Abbas radiallahu anhu. That's why they are called Abbas's, the Banu Abbas. And there is no denying that one of the main golden eras of Islam was the era of the Abbas's. Now pause here. Some people get very emotional. How can you say this was the golden era? The Sahaba was the golden era. There's no question the Sahaba was the golden era. There's no doubt about that. In terms of Iman and Taqwa and piety and ilm, in terms of Zuhd and Ikhras, everything. So we're not talking about the Sahaba, there is no competition with the Sahaba. So, apart from the Sahaba, because there's no competition, they're not in the competition, Aslan. You cannot compete with the Sahaba. Apart from the Sahaba, when did Islam flourish? Apart from the era of the Sahaba. There is no question that the greatest flourishing of Islam after the Sahaba occurred in the time of the early Abbasids especially. The later Abbasids kind of sort of, you know, plateauing and then going down, but the early Abbasids. This is the era of Harun al-Rashid. This is the era of Islamic civilization flourishing. All of the Islamic sciences, the madahib basically, the books of Adid, uh, the, 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 the codes of law, uh, the Arabic language being codified, uh, calligraphy, the recitations of the Quran, qiraat, so Islamic sciences, secular sciences, this is all of these famous guys we mentioned about chemistry and biology. and This is in the time of the Abbasids, right? The famous thousand and one nights, right? Alf, Layla, Walil. It was the, the time frame that is written in is the time of the Abbasids. The city of Baghdad, which was the most, uh, the greatest civilization in all of humanity at the time. A million people living in a city at a time when London had 5,000. 
5,000 people in London and there are a million people in Baghdad. You have lights at night. The lanterns were lit in Baghdad. And again, we can go on and on and on. So the reality is that, you know, from, from the angle of Islam as a civilization, there's no question it was under the children of Abbas radiallahu an that Islam reached the pinnacle of its civilizational glory after the time of the Sahaba. Now, 1258, what happened in 1258 that the Abbasids came to an end? 1258, what happened? Mongols. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. Okay, Mongols came and they destroyed the Abbasid Caliphate. However, interestingly enough, the Abbasid Caliphate did not fully come to an end. When the Mamluks destroyed the Mongols, and the Mamluks were ethnically non-Arabs, the Mamluks were non-Arabs, they were actually somewhat Russians, you can say, Circassians, Russians, they were like a different group. I mean, they're neither Russians nor Turks, but they're basically a group from up there. So the Mamluks wanted to be the Khulafa, but they realized the Muslim Ummah would not accept us. So what did they do? They installed the Queen of England. What do I mean by this? A figurehead. A figurehead. They installed a figurehead. And it is literally called the Shadow Caliphate. That's the term given to it. The Shadow Caliphate. And they found one of the living, because the Mongols massacred all of the Abbasids, the immediate family. But obviously the family is massive, it's large by now. And so they found one of the distant cousins and they installed, so he's a direct descendant of Abbas, obviously. And they installed him, where? Where? Cairo, Qahira. Qahira. And so... Another Abbasid dynasty began in Qahira from 1261 up until 1517. 15, so another 300 years, 200 something years. You still had the Abbasid Caliphate in Qahira. But this is a shadow caliphate. The caliph is simply like the Queen of England. She's in her palace or they're in their palaces. And it is the Mamluks that are essentially in charge. Nonetheless, there is still the official ceremony. Every time a caliph dies, another one comes. There's the official ceremony. This is the Khalifa. The khutbah is read in the name of the Khalifa. So even though it's symbolic, still it is the Khulafa of the Banu Abbas. So the Abbasids essentially were the Khulafa from 750 to 1517. Think about that. The descendants of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib were at least in name for some of those centuries, but still, even in name, let it be, for not 800 years, the descendants of Abbas radiallahu an were the rulers of this ummah. And by the way, interesting tidbit that even I did not know uh, until I was doing my research for this class, that when uh, the Mongols invaded in 1256, uh, 1258, uh, one sub-branch of the family fled and they found refuge in a small province that is called uh, Bastak, Bastak. And it is now in the modern country of Iran. It is now in the modern country of Iran. And that province hosed them, hosted them. That province adopted them and made them their rulers. And I did not know this until I did my own research for this class. That from 1260, 1258, when the Mongols invaded, up until, believe it or not, 1961, the rulers of this small province were from the Abbasids continuously. In 1961, some of you were alive at that time. Before my time, but some of you were alive at that time. And then, of course, the Iranian government basically acquired that region. Otherwise, even um, until 61, they were the governors of that particular um, province. And that essentially, therefore, means that from 750 until 1967, at least some Abbasids continue to have some power somewhere in the uh, Muslim world. Now, what happened in 1517, by the way, that the Mongols, sorry, that the uh, Mamluks stopped having the Abbasid Caliphate? What happened in 1517 to the transfer of the Caliphate? Where did the Khil Khilafah go in 1517? No, no, no. The Fatimids are never our Khulafa. The Ottomans, the Uthmaniyun, in Salim, uh, the Great, uh, in 1517, uh, there is a ceremony between the final Abbasid Caliph who hands over the symbolic mantle and he gives it to the Ottoman 
uh, Caliph Salim in 1517, and that is the first time that a, uh, a, a Turk, a non-Arab, becomes the Khalifa, uh, and then that lasts up until 19... is 21. We still have people alive that were born at that time. SubhanAllah, think about how recent that is. Before we conclude um, today's class, I just wanted to quickly go over, as I typically do, some ahadith from Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an. And there's only a few ahadith from Abbas. Uh, the book that I'm using, as you should all know, is Muslim Imam Ahmed, which is the largest collection of hadith. Uh, uh, as we know, Imam Ahmed collected all of the hadith. And what's uh, interesting, as we know, how did he arrange the hadith, Imam Ahmed? By who? By Sahabi, by companion. So that makes it very easy for us when we want to see what are the hadith of Abdullah of Abbas ibn Abdul Talib. So, in volume three, we have from the hadith that I narrated for, or that he narrated from Abbas ibn Abdul Talib. And we have many, but we're going to do only some of them. So it's very interesting. This is one of my favorite hadith from Abbas, and it really shows um, what Abbas radiallahu anhu is, 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 is thinking about. This hadith is also in Sahih Muslim. Al Abbas ibn Abdul Talib narrated that one day I said, O Messenger of Allah, your uncle Abu Talib used to protect you, and he used to do this, and he used to do that. Were you able to benefit him in the hereafter? Before I answer the question or go on, isn't that a beautiful hadith? Because who is Abbas to Abu Talib? Brother. They're full, they're not full brothers, but they're half brothers, half brothers, right? So Abbas is concerned about his brother, your brother Abu Talib. He did so much for you. He protected you. He defended you. Were you able to do anything for him in the Akhirah? And our Prophet said, yes, I was. إِنَّهُ فِي ضَحْضَاحٍ مِنَ النَّارِ وَلَوْ لَأَنَا كَانَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ Because of me, he is in the peripheries of Jahannam. And otherwise, he would have been in the lowest depths. I've managed to make the punishment much less. Dahda in the fringes. Otherwise, he'd be in the pit of the fire of hell. Uh, the hadith that, the only hadith that is narrated in Sahih Bukhari of, of, of Abbas, Abbas, the only hadith that is narrated in Sahih Bukhari, so it's the most authentic hadith of Abbas radiallahu an, is the famous hadith that is used in fiqh, that the Prophet Abbas narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when a person does sajda, seven things must do sajda with him. His face, his two hands, his two knees, and his two feet. This is a fiqh hadith. And uh, Abbas is the one narrating it, and it demonstrates that, excuse me, when we do sajda, we must have seven body parts touching the ground. If we do not have seven body parts touching the ground, that is not uh, sajda. Uh, and then the last hadith from Abbas, and there's a few more, but these are the main ones I wanted to do. Excuse me, the last hadith we'll do. Uh, Ali ibn Abdullah ibn Abbas came to us for hajj, the narrator is saying. And I said to him, narrate to us a hadith. So he said, my father Abdullah ibn Abbas, narrated from his father Abbas. So there's a family chain, mashallah, right? It's a family chain. So this is the grandson of Abbas narrating the hadith. That one time he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, O Messenger of Allah, I am your uncle, and I am old, and I'm about to die. So teach me something that will benefit me. But a beautiful hadith again. Right? I'm coming to you because I'm your uncle and I'm old and I'm going to die. Meaning, I'm, now, now how did he know the process would die before him? He thought he's going to die first. I'm older than you. I'm going to die. Teach me something that will benefit me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh Abbas, anta ammi, you are my uncle. Wala ughni anka min Allahi shay'a. But I cannot benefit you in front of Allah at all. Just because you're my uncle, that relationship will not benefit you on Judgment Day. But ask Allah for Al-Afiyah. Salillah Al-Afiyah. Ask Allah for Afiyah. And I did this hadith when we're doing the uh, chapters of Dua in the Nawi uh, Bukhari Salihin. 
uh, in this world and the next. So uh, Abbas seemed to like trivialize this, like that's all. You want me to ask for afia? And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ya am, oh my uncle, ask Allah for afia, for there is nothing that is more blessed than afia." And what is afia? We mentioned this in the Nawi class. What is al afia? The absence of any pain or suffering or calamity. We don't want any misery, any pain, any suffering. We ask Allah for afia in this world and the next. Okay? To not have a tragedy is the best blessing. And to not be punished is the best blessing. Because if you're not punished in the akhirah, that means you are rewarded. So, uh, that these are the ahadith of Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an. Very quickly, the next chapter in... Uh, Musnad Imam Ahmad is the uh, chapters of the hadith of Fadl ibn Abbas. Okay, the next chapter is the chapter of Fadl ibn Abbas, and I'll just mention uh, one or two that uh, Fadl ibn Abbas narrated I was the one whom the Prophet وسلم, put behind him on the camel from Muzdalifa until Mina, and he never stopped saying the Talbiyah until he. Hit the Jamrah. So from Muzdalifa to Mina, meaning in the Hajj, the Prophet never stopped saying, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, until he threw the Jamrah. And this now is the fiqhi question when do you stop saying the Talbiyah? And there's actually many positions, many opinions. But this hadith is crystal clear. You stop saying, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, when you arrive back in Mina. After having spent the night in Muzdalifa. So, even after Arafat, you continue the Talbiyah. Even after Arafat, on the night of Muzdalifa, you continue Talbiyah. On your way to Mina, you continue Talbiyah. Then, when you throw the first stone, and on the tenth, you only throw the first pillar. Right? You only throw one pillar. If you haven't done Hajj, then start planning from now. By the way, I'm going for Hajj this year as well, by the way. Just... Put a plug in there as well if you want to come, inshallah ta'ala. But even if you don't come this year, make sure you're planning for it because Hajj is getting more and more expensive, by the way. So don't set it aside. Put it in your plan from now, whenever you can go for Hajj. So when do you stop doing the Talbiyah, as we said, is when you uh, throw the first uh, Jamra. And the other Hadith, majority of them are about Hajj and what was done during Hajj. And we'll just do one more Hadith uh, from the youngest brother of Abbas. Uh, that uh, narrated from the Prophet uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, uh, Sorry, not the youngest Hadith Ubaidullah ibn Abbas Hadith Ubaidullah ibn Abbas So this is Ubaidullah, the one that we just mentioned The generous one Hadith of Ubaidullah ibn Abbas And by the way, the rest of the book is the Hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas And it goes on to the next chapter So Abdullah ibn Abbas Narrated of the most Hadith out of all of the Sahaba The top five Abdullah bin Abbas is amongst them. Okay? So the other siblings, two, three, and Ubaidullah ibn Abbas, one hadith. Look, the chapter is just one. The chapter of Ubaidullah ibn Abbas. One hadith. That's all he has. That's all he narrated. And that's all that is preserved. It is Abdullah ibn Abbas who is the scholar of the ummah. The hadith of Ubaidullah ibn Abbas is a little bit fiqhi issue. Um, but um, I'm not going to translate it. But the, it goes as follows that... Um, as you know, in Islam, a lady uh, and a man, once they have divorced three times, they're not allowed to get married, correct? You know this fiqhi issue, right? Once the three triple divorce has taken place, what must happen in order for the marriage to take place again? She has to marry another man, okay? So this issue is what this hadith mentions. So the lady was triple divorced and she had to marry another man. So she married another man, but refused to be intimate. Because she wanted to go back to the first one. So it was a type of trickery, and that's not allowed in Islam. And so the complaint came to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Are you trying to go back to the first one? La, that's not going to happen. Means you don't want to be a wife to him, you married him. 
You cannot now say I don't want to be a wife. That doesn't. You can't. That that you can't have it that way. And then the hadith says that basically. I mean, I'm not going to translate it because it will require ten minutes of explanation. But the gist of it is, until you consummate the marriage, then there's a legitimate talaq. Then you can, after the idda, go back and marry the first one. You cannot play games with the Sharia. Have a fake marriage contract. Just get a marriage done. No, the game that doesn't work that way. Okay, so. The marriage must be consummated. This hadith is Ubaidullah ibn Abbas hadith. That you cannot just have a fake marriage contract. So it must be a legitimate marriage. So by the way, what this means is you cannot have a fake marriage. And a fake marriage is batil in the eyes of Allah, even if in the eyes of men it is accepted. Meaning, if your niyyah was, oh, I'm just having this fake marriage, right? Just to get them back or get her back or get him back, right? If that was the niyyah in the eyes of Allah, doesn't work that way. You must marry a genuine marriage, a real marriage, and then an issue must arise in that other marriage that doesn't work out, and then after the talaq and idda, if you want to, then you can go back to the first husband. Okay, so this hadith is the main hadith that is used, Ubaid ibn Abbas, to demonstrate that that second marriage must be a legitimate marriage. And if there's to be a fake marriage, it will not be accepted in the eyes of Allah. That's from Ubaidullah ibn Abbas. So inshallah with this we have come to the conclusion of uh, today's lecture. Next week inshallah we have done all the preliminaries. We will dive directly into Abdullah ibn Abbas who is one of the most fascinating of the uh, Sahaba and the Habr of the Ummah and the Tajmah al-Quran. Any quick questions before we uh, conclude for today? Any questions about Ibn Abbas and the family of the Prophet Sallallahu and Abbas Ibn Anu Talib? He's worried about marriage. <laughs> no, I'm not worried about marriage. <laughs> he used to marry so many and that was no big deal. I didn't even get into You didn't even get into the multiple marriages. He did not even mention those. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. The question I asked was based on what you told us. I mean, that's, it's, a, it's about a matter of Niyah and victory. So... A marriage in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be a legitimate marriage. These other things that take place on paper or whatnot, that's something we have to, that's a different discussion. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the nikah has certain conditions and it must be met in this regard. Um, now, you cannot negate that there might be other privileges that come with marriage. And if that's one of the niyas of marriage, didn't our Prophet say a woman is married for four reasons? And of them is wealth, and of them is fame and sharaf, and of them is money. And these other three, these other four, uh, I mean religion as well, are they illegitimate? Like if a woman has sharaf. Now sharaf in our, di in our times, lineage has gone down, nobody cares about lineage that much. Nobody, unless the family is, so imagine if again, in the American context, if the family is the Kennedy for example, right? So even the son-in-laws of the Kennedys have positions of power, okay? Um, and there are many people uh, that are famous in politics. They're married into old families, and they became famous in politics, right? So that's, you're marrying. Is it haram to marry for multiple reasons? No. So if one of the reasons is, and it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. If a woman marries for financial security and religion, is that wrong? Of course not. It's common sense. But our process is saying prioritize the religion. Not that don't care about financial stability. Every woman should marry somebody who's financially stable. This is in the hadith. It's in the hadith when two men propose in the process. As for him, he has no money. He said this, he has no money. He didn't say he's not pious. So we have to be very clear here. There's nothing wrong with having multiple niyyas. But there must be legitimate nikah done. And this person in the hadith... This lady, it's pretty clear, and that's what the Prophet said. It seems like you want to, don't want to have a marriage. You want to go back to him. La, that's not going to happen. So he understood what she's trying to do. So no, that's not going to happen. You have to be a wife to him, and then if something happens, then talaq, then you can go back, inshallah. Okay. You know the problem with marriage questions is khalas. Everybody starts asking, and I know it's marriage related, correct? <laughs> yes, that's the problem. So can we just? Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Is 
No, it is not halal to marry a person that has been triple divorced for the niyyah, for the niyyah to make the previous marriage permissible. Anybody who does this, the marriage is batil in the eyes of Allah. We cannot know your niyyah, but Allah knows your niyyah. Anybody who does this, the marriage is batil. And in the hadith in Abu Dawood, in fact, it's very severe. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cursed such a person. Al-Muhallil wal muhallil It's cursed. La'natullah. And in one hadith, and it's a bit vulgar, but it needs to be said. It's a hadith. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called such a person a tays al-musta'ar. Like the hired like donkey or bull. Like the most vulgar thing. You know, animals, if you understand farm animals, if you want to make your animal pregnant, your, your female animal, you will hire, or they would hire, uh, another animal, you know, to mate. And in this hadith, the Prophet literally said, this type of marriage is like a hired, you know, donkey or bull. Like just a, something, it's somewhat vulgar to say, but it gets the point across. How can this be possible? So such a... Marriage is batil in the eyes of Allah. It is accursed in the eyes of Allah. And if we come to find out about it, even in our fiqh, now that we know about it, we'll say, no, you cannot go back to the husband now. Okay? Now, without getting very controversial, one of the madhabs does not see it that way. Hence, you have been exposed to your soap operas and dramas in which these types of things occurs. Otherwise, for the rest of the world, other than that particular madhab, it is never done. But in one culture, we have heard of these things, and it is common for the Mulvi Sahab to give sadaqah, mashallah, tabarakallah, and get married in this regard. And in reality, it is one of the eccentric issues of that madhab that generally I'm very tolerant and we respect all the madhahib, but this particular issue, la hawla khusira billah, is just not allowed. It should not be done. And <laughs> no need to mention, inshallah. You, 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 no, 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 one of the Sunni Madahib, yeah. One of the Sunni Madahib, yeah. But, but don't worry, your, your people have not, are not familiar with it, so you stick with your madhab. Don't change madhab just for that reason, yaqi. You know, don't, yaqi, don't. St stick with your madhab, <laughs> okay. Because we don't want anybody to misunderstand disrespect, okay. La, 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 this is within Sunni madhahib, that's why. Yeah. Shias have other things, but not. this is not within them, inshallah. Inshallah, with this we conclude, we'll continue next uh, Wednesday.